My name is Ephraim Smith. I'm one of the pastors here. And yes, we are celebrating 13 years as a church. So uh, she don't like a lot of attention, but you know, we talk about Pastor Bob and how this started, but Pastor Bob wouldn't have been able to step out on faith if his wife, his partner in life, didn't step out with him. So Letty Ballion, wave your hand. Thank you, sis. Wow, now some of y'all, like, y'all, y'all look older than 13. I, I, I know, I know, I know. We just, we, we, we just, we outgrowing our clothes, I guess. So, but we are only 13 years old. But praise God, who would have thought that in 13 years, God would do so much in the life of this church. So we're grateful, grateful, grateful. So we are celebrating, so I want this message to be celebratory as well. So we are going to go to a great celebratory book in the Bible and launch a new sermon series today. So we're going to the book of Leviticus. Yes, the book of Leviticus. I know you were just reading this book this week. I know you were just like, oh Lord, I'm so glad Pastor Ephraim is taking us to the Old Testament, to the book of Leviticus. I've read this book about 17 times. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, let's, let's see if you'll love this book by the time I'm done with it. Leviticus chapter 25, beginning with verse 8. Leviticus chapter 25, beginning with verse 8. Count off seven Sabbath years, seven times seven years, so that the seven Sabbath years amount to a period of 49 years. Then have the trumpet sounded everywhere on the 10th day of the seventh month on the day of atonement. Sound the trumpet throughout your land. Consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. Each of you is to return to your family property, to your own clan. The 50th year shall be a jubilee for you. Do not sow, do not reap what grows of itself or harvest the untended vines. For it is a jubilee and it is to be holy for you. Eat only what is taken directly from the fields. In this year of jubilee, everyone is to return to their own property. We are launching a new series called Matters of the Heart today. God's love for the church and the world. And we are talking about our heart of celebration. We're talking about generosity and jubilee today. So pray with me. God, I pray this would be your message. Ultimately, you would be speaking and I would just be the vessel, the vehicle that you have decided to use to say what you want to say to these, your beloved children, my sisters and brothers. God, I desire to be obedient to your word. So please let it be done in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. We're talking about celebration today generosity and jubilee. We are in a culture of celebration. I mean, we celebrate things. We celebrate birthdays. We celebrate holidays. We celebrate anniversaries. We celebrate when our favorite sports team wins. You know, some of y'all, you know, your favorite sports team, you've won a lot of championships. See, why are you, why are you teasing me like that? Yeah, I know. <laughs> The Minnesota Vikings have not ever won a Super Bowl. I know this. I don't know what it's like to be a San Francisco 49er fan. I don't know what it's like to be a Raider fan because we ain't never won a Super Bowl. Yaddy daddy. But yes, one day I'm believing God that God will move in the universe in such a way that the Minnesota Vikings will win the Super Bowl and I will be able to celebrate this and I'm going to come out here with my purple and go, y'all ain't going to be able to tell me nothing. Nothing. But until that day, I celebrate birthdays and Christmas and (laughs) Juneteenth. (laughs) But we live in a culture of celebration. Some celebrations, as we get older, they're more meaningful. Wedding anniversaries. When we turn 18, when we turn 21, when we turn 50, when we turn 60, when we celebrate these milestones, celebration is all in our culture. I mean, when I was a kid, I celebrated. I couldn't wait for my birthday, which is September. My birthday is in September. September 10th, to be exact, is my birthday. That's your birthday, too? What? What? God, yeah, yeah, yeah. And God put you in the front row just so we can do that. 
Look at God. Won't he do it? Do it, won't he? Okay, well, September. And then, so when I was a kid, I loved celebrating my birthday. I loved celebrating Christmas because, you know, I was getting gifts. And, but, you know, you, you get older and the gifts get different. So now I'd rather eat than get a gift. So I celebrate Thanksgiving, Juneteenth, 4th of July. But celebrations in our culture. But I want you to know that before all of the celebrations that we celebrate in our culture today, God introduced celebration to his chosen people. He had taken a people out of slavery in Egypt, made a covenant with them in the desert, and introduced celebration into their lives. This may surprise you, but God is a God of celebration. Christ did some remarkable things in the New Testament during celebrations. His first miracle, turning water to wine, happened at a wedding celebration. He, he, he used the, the contemporary festivals and celebrations to show himself as the son of God, as the son of man. God is a God of celebration. So that's why we're in Leviticus today, because maybe you avoided the book of Leviticus because you thought, first of all, I can't pronounce all those Hebrew names. Second, it's just a bunch of laws and decrees and commands. You're unclean or you're clean or this is what you got to do here. It's like, oh, Lord, the book of Leviticus, really? Well, the book of Leviticus, after further investigation and reading, is more than just a book of commands and laws and decrees. It actually shows that God is more than a God of decrees and commands and laws, that God is a God of celebration. The book of Leviticus can be broken down into three themes, three themes. So one is there's a theme of obedience there. So yes, there are commands and teachings in the book of Leviticus, and God is saying, I want you to be obedient to these commands, to these teachings, to these laws. But it's not just a, a book of obedience, it's also a book of remembrance. He's saying, I want you to remember that I am the God that saw you in oppression. I am the God that saw you in slavery. I am the God that saw you destitute and I rescued you. I delivered you. So I want you to remember, tell your children, tell your grandchildren, tell your great-grandchildren, pass it down generation after generation. Don't forget this, remember. So Leviticus is a book of obedience. It's a book of remembrance, but it's also a book of of celebration. It is a book that tells us we are to celebrate as God's people. The other thing it helps us to understand is celebration is not meant to be simply a reaction. Because in our culture, it's like your, your favorite team wins a championship, reaction, I celebrate. It's my birthday, I open up the gift, I like the gift, I celebrate. It's Christmas, I open up the gift, I like the gift, I celebrate. In our culture, if we're honest, celebration is a reaction. God wants celebration to be a rhythm. God wants a rhythm of celebration, of joy in our lives. Why? Because we live in such a broken, sinful, upside down world that God wants to put a rhythm of celebration in our lives so that when times get tough, when we're going through challenges and stresses, we won't lose our faith and we won't lose our joy. Because God doesn't want celebration to simply be a, a, a reaction, but a rhythm. So we build in rhythms in our lives to celebrate. We celebrated last weekend the, the resurrection of Christ Jesus. We celebrate. We, we celebrate things, and I'm going to get deeper into what these celebrations look like so that they can become the rhythms of our lives. The rhythm of your life is not sustained anger. It's not sustained pity. It's not sustained arrogance. It's not sustained unforgiveness. It is a sustaining of a rhythm of joy, generosity, and celebration. So Leviticus presents to us two types of celebrations. One is called the Sabbath. It's represented by the number seven. And Sabbath is about rest, Rest, yes, rest. I'm going to break this down a little further in a minute, but rest is something that we are to celebrate. 
Also, there is the word jubilee. Jubilee is represented by the number 50 in the book of Leviticus, and jubilee is about freedom. So rest and freedom as the rhythms of celebration in our lives are presented to us in Leviticus. And so I want to go a little further, breaking down what do the celebrations of God look like? What do the celebrations of God look like knowing not all celebrations are of God. There's some parties that ain't for us. There's some celebrations you got to be careful with. You know, sometimes I'll be out and, you know, I, I open the door and I say, everybody put your, that celebration ain't for me right there. That, oh, I ain't supposed to, you know, some people get in trouble because they walk into parties that they ain't got no business walking into. Some people get caught up in scandals. They get caught up in somebody else's scandal because they get too close to somebody else's celebration that wasn't meant for them to celebrate. So you got to be careful what celebrations you dive deep into because every celebration ain't of God. So sometimes coming into an intimate relationship with God is getting the wisdom and the discernment of what celebrations you should step into and what celebrations you should distance yourself from based on what your life purpose is. But then there's the flip side. For some people, when you come into an intimate relationship with God, you learn what celebrations to distance yourself from. But for others, coming into an intimate relationship with God gives you the freedom to realize you can celebrate in God. Amen. Some of us grew up in traditions where we thought if it was godly, you couldn't celebrate. Some, some people grew up in religious experiences where it's like, shut up, we in church. Shh. Don't you say, shh, shut up. Do, do, do. Be quiet and hear God. You thought if it put you to sleep, it was holy. You was like, oh, 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 praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Oh, my gosh, this must be really a sanctified moment right here. So some of us grew up, you couldn't party, you couldn't go to movies, you couldn't play cards, you couldn't play dominoes, you couldn't dance, you couldn't listen to the blues, you couldn't listen to jazz. You couldn't. I remember one time, uh, you know, when I was at a place in my Christian life, I was really young, and I thought I was getting into a deeper place with God. And so it's like, you know, I, uh, I was like, I got to get rid of all my secular music because I'm going to be really tight with God. So I'm just going to keep this, this music over here. And at the time, music that was Christian, some of it was good and some of it was like, so it's like, I threw away my Stevie Wonder, my Earth, Wind & Fire, my OJs, my Isley Brothers, my, my, I threw away Donny Hathaway, Curtis Mayfield, and then, oh, Lord, yeah, yes, this, I, because I thought I couldn't have that kind of music and be tight with God, so I had my garbage bag, and like, I'm getting holy today, and I, and I threw it away, and the next day, I jumped in that dumpster looking for that. I was like, I don't know what in the world I was thinking. God is all through songs in the key of life with Stevie Wonder. Lord, shoot, you want to you meet God, you got to listen to Mighty Mighty by Earth, Wind, and Fire. What was I thinking? People all over the world. John, what was I thinking? And the rest of the music, I had to go to Cheapo Records and replace it. I was like, because some of us came up in traditions where you couldn't celebrate. You couldn't pop your finger. You couldn't pat your foot couldn't bob your head and it be God. We thought it had to be boring to be a blessing. So for some of us, God is trying to show you, no, God is not simply to in, in total just a God of judgment, a God of anger, a God of laws, a God of decrees, a God of commands. God is also a God of celebration. He turned water to wine at a wedding reception. No, it wasn't grape juice. <laughs> this is what God did. So God is a God of celebration. But what do these celebrations look like? What does the party of God look like? Point one, we are called to a celebration of rest. A celebration of of rest in Leviticus chapter 25 verse 1 it says this the Lord said to Moses at Mount Sinai speak to the Israelites and say to them when you enter the land I'm going to give you the land itself must observe a Sabbath to the Lord 
For six years, sow your fields, and for six years, prune your vineyards and gather their crops. But in the seventh year, the land is to have a year of Sabbath rest, a Sabbath to the Lord. Do not sow your fields or prune your vineyards. Do not reap what grows of itself or harvest the grapes of your untended vines. The land is to have a year of rest. Whatever the land yields during the Sabbath year will be food for you, for yourself, your male and female servants, and the hired worker and temporary resident who live among you, as well as for your livestock and the wild animals in your land. Whatever the land produces may be eaten. A celebration of rest. God tells them in the seventh year, do not work for a whole year year. Don't put seed in the ground. Don't plow. Don't grab the mule. Don't work. Don't labor. You, I don't want you to experience anything that is the outcome of your own hands for a whole year. I want you to rest for the entire seventh year. It is a Sabbath. Wow. I know some of us are thinking, I wish God would tell me to take a whole year off work. I would go to work and say, I got to talk to you about something. The Lord was talking to me through Pastor Ephraim yesterday, and uh, I just figured out this is the seventh year. So y'all supposed to give me the whole year off. Don't you do that. Don't you, don't you do that. You, you, don't blame me for getting fired tomorrow. Don't you do that. Don't you do that. What is the point here? The point is this. Here's the real context. They had been slaves in Egypt. Their entire identity were the objects, the subjects of free labor for the economy of the Egyptian empire. They were stripped of their humanity to function as slaves and Egypt. So, so day after day, their identity was labor, 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 slavery. God is saying, now that you're in relationship with me, I want you to trust me so much that for a year, you will trust the Lord over your own labor. This is the principle of the celebration of rest. We talk about now a Sabbath being one day a week, at least having one day out of seven days where you unplug from work, where your identity is not in work. Why is this important? Because originally the context, they were slaves. God saw their oppression. God pulled them out of slavery. Slavery set them free. They are out of Egypt, but maybe Egypt is still in them. They are out of slavery, but maybe slavery is still in them. They are out of, of being dehumanized, but maybe they have a sense of self-hatred. They still don't see themselves as fully human. God is saying, I want you to trust me so much as your source that for a period of time, you won't focus on your labor, but you will focus on your Lord. Amen. The God who brought you out of slavery. Do you trust your labor or do you trust me? This is a question we all have to ask ourselves today. Do you celebrate rest? Or are you in a continual enslavement of celebrating your own labor? your own work. Some of us, we just don't know how to unplug from work. It's Saturday. I'm still looking at my phone. I'm still checking my emails. I'm still trying to see, okay, I finished the week, but now I got to get ready for the next week. It's Sunday, and I'm still thinking about, like, I didn't even take two days. I really didn't have a weekend. I really didn't unplug from my job because I took my job into the weekend. I'm at my kid's soccer game, but I'm still checking emails from work. I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to be with my family, and I'm, I'm supposed to be at the dinner table. I'm supposed to be at the breakfast table, but I can't unplug. I can't rest. If you can't can't celebrate rest, you have surrendered to the enslavement of your labor. And God doesn't want your identity to be in what you do, but in who and whose you are. What does celebrating rest look like for you? Some of us, if we're honest, we don't rest well. We don't rest well. 
When's the last time you slept? Seven, eight hours at night, like good sleep, like good, like. (laughs) Some of y'all said, you talking about my husband. How you know that's what my husband do? I'm supposed to celebrate that? No. (laughs) Rest is to be celebrated. The principle is, do you trust the Lord over your labor? Your Lord, your God over what you are doing in your own power. Because we can only produce so much. I don't care how many hours you put to the plow. I don't care how many hours a week you work. I don't care how many times you get promoted. I don't care how many times you get a raise. I don't care if they move you from a cubicle to an office to a bigger office. There are some issues in the soul. There are some issues in society that your labor cannot solve. Labor can't keep a marriage together. Labor can't fully raise kids. Labor can't build generosity. Labor doesn't build character and integrity. You can have a good job, make a whole bunch of money, have a big name for yourself, and have no character, no integrity. You can be a liar. You can be a cheater. You can be an oppressor. And labor, good. It's when you unplug from labor labor and plug into the love of God that you truly find who you are. God is saying, I took you out of Egypt. I'm about to take Egypt out of you. A celebration of rest. Not only is it also trusting the Lord over labor, it's even trusting the Lord over the land. He said, don't you do nothing to that land for a whole year and trust that your God will still do things in the ecosystem, in the environment that are still sustain you. Keep this in context. He wants so much for these formerly enslaved people to be liberated and loved. He's saying, you, you trusted me to take you out of slavery Do you trust me to feed you for a year? It raises the question, who is your source? Is society your source or is the Savior your source? Who is your source? He said, trust the Lord over the labor. Trust the Lord over the land. Why is this important? I'm trying to get out of point one. I really am. It's because when people trust the land, the creation over the Lord and the creator, they will start making false gods out of the creation. They'll make idols that look like animals and they'll worship them. They will make idols out of human beings. They will take the things that God created, animals. They'll take the things that God created, uh, human beings, and they will make them false gods instead of worshiping the real God. Why settle for what is created when you can have an intimate relationship with the creator? Don't make a God out of anything God made. Don't make Uh, Don't make a person God. It'll move from a church to a cult when you do that. Some some people are lifting pastors up way higher than they need to be lifted up. I mean, you know, treat me good now. I mean, I don't know. (laughs) Who are you? Don't do that. Don't do me like that. But, 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 you know, you ain't got to make me Reverend Ike. You know what I'm saying? You You ain't got to do that. I, you know I, 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 I want to be a pastor, not a pimp. I want to be a pastor. <laughs> so I'm just saying, don't, 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 you know, me and Pastor Bob ain't going to be walking around with mink coats talking about, <laughs> <laughs> Letty and Donisha will do something about that. <laughs> Letty and Donisha would do something about that. So what I'm saying is, will you trust God as your source. The Bible says that God rested on the seventh day, but God didn't rest because God was tired. Get the principle here. It's a celebration. 
You think God rested on the seventh day because God was like, oh, Lord, do you know what it's like making a giraffe and a hippopotamus and an eagle and an owl at the same time my back? Man, do you know what it's like hanging the moon and the sun and the stars and putting them accurately in the galaxies so that they will be in the universe as they are supposed to be? Look at my hands from Christ. God wasn't tired. God was celebrating. When God took a rest, God just stepped back and said, mm, mm, look at that. Angels, angels, angels. Yeah, I did that right there. Look at that. Yeah. That is called a hippopotamus. I'm going to let Adam think he named it, though. God didn't rest because he was tired. He rested out of joy. And so should you. Don't wait till you're exhausted. Don't wait till you've hit a wall. Don't wait till you've lost everything to rest. I'm out of point one. Okay, point two, a celebration of freedom. A celebration of freedom. Leviticus 25, verse eight. Count off seven Sabbath years, seven times seven years, so that the seven Sabbath years amount to a period of 49 years. That's a lot of numbers for a theater major like me. Then have the trumpet sounded everywhere on the 10th day of the seventh month, on the day of atonement, sound the trumpet throughout your land. That's a celebration. Consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. Each of you is to return to your family property, to your own clan. The 50th year shall be a jubilee for you. Do not sow and do not reap what grows of itself or harvest the untended vines, for it is a jubilee. It is to be holy for you. Eat only what is taken directly from the fields. In this year of of jubilee, everyone is to return to their own property. A celebration of freedom. They were slaves in Egypt. God delivered them. Now he's saying every 50th year, I want you to have an amazing celebration where you remember your freedom in a radical way. I want people to be freed not only from slavery in Egypt, I want them to be freed from anything that's enslaving them in society now. Give them their land back. What? Give them their property back. What? Just imagine this. Imagine your grandparents had owned land and had a house on the land, and then they passed it down to your parents. And then they passed it down to you and you lost it. For circumstances out of your control, some in your control, you lost the land, you lost the house. But one day, the year of Jubilee is proclaimed and they come to you and they say, come back to your land. Come back to your home. But I lost it and I don't have the money. We didn't ask you that. It's the year of Jubilee. It's the year of freedom, which means for God, freedom is not just liberation. Freedom is restoration. Oh, you got to go with me further. With God, freedom is liberation, restoration, and might I say reparation? In the Bible. Now, here's the difference. Here's the difference. Here's the difference. Go with me. God is taking a people that were slaves and restoring them to become a nation, to have home ownership, to have property and land. Some people use this text and they reverse the dynamic. Some people have used scriptures like this and they're already a powerful nation. They already have military might. They already have an economy and they use this to go take land and say, God told us to take it. They take your house, say, God told us to take your house. God told us to invade your nation. God told us to own you. God told us to take, no, 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 no. This is about a rise from slavery to empowerment, not empowerment to colonizing. That's not what this text is saying. Go with me here. Please go with me. God has a plan for nations, 
for people to participate in the upliftment and rising of people that started at the bottom, not for the people at the top to keep advancing their territory off the backs of the people at the bottom. God has a liberation plan that is empowering to the least of these and should raise up generosity in those that have the most. The more you have, the more generous you should be. The more you have, the more you should be giving of your time, talent, and treasure to uplift and empower. I'm not talking about a welfare program. I'm talking about social and spiritual upliftment and advancement so that people, I'm like James Brown. I don't want nobody to give me nothing. Open up the door, I get it myself. The prophet James Brown. God is saying freedom in the land, freedom for the people, an opportunity for those that have more to be generous to those that have less, not for dependency, but for empowerment. And we are to celebrate this. We are to celebrate freedom. I told you that Leviticus is about celebration, obedience, and remembrance. The reason this text is so revolutionary, so radical, I know I have to be careful preaching it because y'all think I'm trying to be political. I'm trying to be biblical. I'm trying to bring a biblical framework for how the church is to celebrate and bring generosity and empowerment to the world. I ain't trying to give you no conservative or liberal agenda. I'm trying to give you a biblical framework for who the church is supposed to be in this nation and beyond. So, so, so this freedom is only powerful as long as they remember slavery. If if they have to remember, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, I'm the one who brought you out of slavery in Egypt, and I'm calling you now to do this, to do this, to celebrate freedom, which means they are to remember slavery so that they have a deep, powerful understanding and appreciation for freedom, living their freedom and extending the freedom to other people. This this is important. This is why it's, it's important not to downplay or sanitize or forget slavery. Because if you forget where you came from, you not understand the depths of what you've been brought from and what God is calling you to. Some people want to rewrite history books. Slavery wasn't all that bad. They ate three times a day. No, 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 no. You can't celebrate freedom and have amnesia about slavery. Can't do it. Can't do it. Can't have amnesia about slavery and celebrate freedom because what are you celebrating? Freedom from what? Freedom to do what? My wife and I, Denise and I are getting ready to go to Ghana this week. And we're going to go to the slave dungeons. We're going to go to the point of no return. We're going to go to the docks where the slave ships left. And we're going to reclaim these spots with other pastors and their spouses as places of healing, as places of liberation, as places of strength to heal from trauma that we may be carrying and not even know it. Because how can you sanitize slavery? It's people shackled on top of each other in dungeons. It's people at the bottom of slave ships on top of each other. This is why we got to celebrate rest and freedom. 
Because the way you strip somebody of their humanity is to take their freedom and to take their rest. And how can you rest when you're chained on top of people that are dying and sick and no sanitation? I know we're going to trip out today because we got an issue here at the church and our, because our bathrooms are out of order right now. So we got we to have somebody come out and they got to address our bathrooms right now. But could you imagine for four months, no bathrooms and chained on top of people? The stripping of your humanity, the stripping stripping of of your humanity is connected to no rest, no rest, no rest. That's why we can't sanitize slavery. Tell it like it is so that we know whose we is and where we're going. I know that wasn't very grammatical for a doctorate degree, but you understand. Let me close with this, a celebration for the disadvantaged. Leviticus 25 Verse 35 says, if any of your fellow Israelites become poor and are unable to support themselves among you, help them as you would a foreigner and a stranger so they can continue to live among you. Do not take interest or any profit from them, but fear your God so that they may continue to live among you. You must not lend them money at interest or sell them food at a profit. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and to be your God. If any of your fellow Israelites become poor and sell themselves to you, do not make them work as slaves. That's key because they used to be slaves. So how are you going to make slaves out of people when God brought you out of slavery? If God brought you out of slavery, how are you going to believe in God and make slaves? He's saying they are to work for you. He says they are to be treated as hired workers or temporary residents among you. They are to work for you until the year of Jubilee. Then they and their children are to be released and they will go back to their own clans and to the property of their ancestors because the Israelites are my servants whom I brought out of Egypt. They must not be sold as slaves. Do not rule over them ruthlessly, but fear your God. This celebration is for the disadvantaged too. We need to take the celebration beyond just us. We come together on Sundays and we celebrate a risen Savior. We celebrate our God, but we are to take this celebration out of this room. That's why one of our board members, Ron Knapp, one of our members, uh, Tara uh, Getty, they, there's an organization that we help to put together, we partner with called Be Encouraged. Be encouraged about private showers with dignity for the unhoused. It's bringing, it's bringing clothes. It's bringing hygiene kits. It's bringing food to the unhoused. It's advocating in a biblical way for affordable housing. There is too much money in this state for there not to be affordable housing throughout the entirety of it. You can't say your agenda and your political ideology is for the poor and have this much homelessness in your state. It makes no sense. It makes no sense. So we're not being political. We're being biblical at Midtown. And we are out here week after week after week building family relationships with the unhoused. Be encouraged. We also adopt under-resourced schools. And my wife, Danisha, and I, founded Influential Global Ministries is a separate but partnered ministry to Midtown Church. Pastor Bob is on the board. His daughter, Taylor, is on the board. Dave Hansen, our CFO, is on the board. Danisha and I make no compensation from this organization. We raise money for it. That's how we built the partnership with World Vision, and that's why we sponsored 317 children in Ghana, bringing them out of poverty. Because we take the celebrations around the world. God gave Bob and Letty Ballion a vision that this would not just be a diverse church, but this would be a church of righteousness and justice, of truth, that the love of God would go throughout this region and throughout the world. And Donisha and I said yes seven years ago to join them in this effort. So Danisha and I are going to Ghana. We're going to Ghana this Wednesday. Last year, this is a little booklet World Vision put together for us. And and, and last year, we sponsored 317 children in this church. Y'all did that. But together, amen. But together with four other churches, we sponsored 1,200 kids in Ghana. And this year, 
Our goal is to get that number to 2,000 and get Midtown's number from 317 to 500. You can do that today. There's a card on your seat. Looks like this. How many people did Chosen last year at this church? Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much. So for those of you that didn't, here's an opportunity to do it today if you would like. All you got to do is take this postcard. You take your phone. You scan that QR code. It will ask you if you would like to sponsor a child in Ghana or Sierra Leone. You say yes to that. Maybe you want to sponsor two. It's $39 a month. You then fill out the information that's on your phone. You then go outside to the World Vision tents. You take a picture, and instead of us having the packets of the kids out there for you to choose, Danisha and I, when we're in Ghana, a week from today, we're going to be at a party where we're going to watch children go into a tent and choose you to be their sponsor. That's what this book is right here. This is full of all the families at Midtown that said yes to be chosen and the children that chose you. I got Jerry and Renette Manuel in here. I got Taylor Ballion in here. Gus and Krista Armstead, on and on and on. The kids that chose you. Let's choose more so they can be educated, They can be lifted out of poverty and we can move on to projects like building schools and mechanizing clean water wells in these communities. Amen? I just want to say, Jesus doesn't lead us to wait every seven years for rest or every 50 years for freedom. When Jesus came on the scene, he said, I have come to set the captives free, to give sight to the blind, to proclaim the year of Jubilee. So you and I are called sisters and brothers to bring the celebration of God's love, God's peace, God's generosity, God's truth, and God's justice to a world that needs it the most. I pray that you will. Amen. So, oh, I know we're supposed to leave. That, I think that they're going to play the music in a minute because I got a theme song. But uh, some people from our board and prayer team thought they would love to pray for me and Danisha as we get ready to go to Ghana. So I, I know people got to leave. We've got to get the crowd out of here. But if some of y'all would love to pray for us as we get ready to go to Ghana, we're going to stand right down here. And I know Beth Jones from our prayer team and board and some others are going to pray for Danisha and I. We thank y'all for doing that. God bless y'all. Thanks for coming today. And as always, we appreciate y'all so much for watching. Now, be sure to stay connected with us by clicking that little subscribe button. All you have to do is click here to join. (laughs) Oh, and you know what? While you're here, be sure to check out this video that we know you're going to love. We'll see you next time, guys, and God bless.